Commission Factory. Hey there, hustlers. Welcome back to season two of Flex Your Hustle. And do we have an absolutely cracking series for you. This season has it all. From the hustle growth stories you've grown to love, introductions to new publishers and technology changing the industry, and plenty of revealing moments where we go deep on what it's like to be a founder. Just like today's episode with Irene Falcone. Irene is probably one of the most interesting and inspiring marketers I think I've ever met. After being frustrated with the low quality, sugar-loaded non-alcoholic alternatives that are available in supermarkets and bottle shops, Irene launched Sands Drinks. Today, Sands Drinks is Australia's leading superstore for premium non-alcoholic beer, wine and spirits, including Australia's first physical non-alcoholic bottle shop in Sydney's Westfield Warringah Mall. Irene is also a bit of a serial entrepreneur, having launched and sold her previous business Nourish Life for $20 million to ASX-listed BWX Limited. Her open and honest way of communicating to her customers and unique approach as the face of her business has generated much applause and fans throughout the years. This episode is not the usual episode though, namely because we caught Irene the very same morning she decided to completely overhaul her entire business. Faced with competition from large retailers like Dan Murphy's and Woolworths, Irene decided to do something pretty huge. Stick around to hear her story. I'm Irene, Irene Falcone, and I am the founder of Sands Drinks, which is the non-alcoholic bottle shop in Australia. That's my second business. And my first business that I founded was called Nourish Life. And that was like a superstore selling toxin-free and natural products. Let's just get into it. You're a bit of a high achiever. So what is it from an inspiring perspective? What is it now that you seek out for inspiration and to learn from? This is going to sound crazy but how to work less, how to step back, do not make my business the end all and be all. When I sold my company, I sold my soul and I'm inspired by people that can separate their companies that they founded to them as a person and have a little bit of work-life balance. Mm. That's what I'm seeking out the most. The success of my business is so ingrained into how I feel every day. I thought there was something wrong with me mentally. I thought maybe I actually had bipolar and that's why I'm so successful. That is many people's and successful people's superpower being really high and really happy and then really low. The swings were so dramatic. So my husband took me along to a GP and I got a referral to a psychiatrist. So I was saying, what, you know, tell me about your manic (laughs) stages and your not manic. Mm. And I was like, well, when I get a lot of orders, <laughs> reviews, I feel really happy. And yeah. when I get a bad review or the, I've had a slow sales day, I feel really depressed. I was trying to convince him that I had bipolar, but you know what? You don't have bipolar. What you have is a very high stressful job and have closeness to your business. I think you need to try and get a little bit of balance there. Mm. I mean, it's really hard. We have a lot of founders on this show and most of them are a bit like you and like what you've just been doing with Sands Drink. Started with a couple of stores here and there, so you might have a couple of retail stores, but predominantly it's an e-com world. And like you can't turn off. It's it's a every day, the data's in front of you. You're Every looking. time the RBA increases their interest rates, my sales drop 50% the next day. I need to learn and and adapt or else I'm going to go into a mental health spiral. I mean, we just had um, Anthony Napper from Oz Hair and Beauty was in the studio a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about the fact that um, his dad had to step in and tell him to calm down because what would happen is if there weren't enough sales in that hour, he would be going on the website and plugging an order to see if the website had broken. That's what I Because he was do. that obsessive. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't have anybody in my life except for my husband who just says, <clears throat> something wrong with you. And yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. My husband said to me, is everything okay with the website, Irene? The word you never want to hear as an e-com owner. Oh, no. So I looked on Shopify and it like had like hardly like three sales. And I just burst into tears and I was panicking and I was sweating. And anyway, I didn't know what to do. And I was, I called my social media guy and I was like, what's happened? Has all the ads stopped? Has something happened? Has the credit had maxed out? Mm. What's going on? And he said, no, Shopify is reporting's down. You've got the sales. Don't worry. It's just the reporting. It's all okay. Don't panic. (laughs) 
it does unfortunately tell you some information that I don't want to know. I don't want to know what is exactly the percentage up or down from the week mm. average to the time to the to the minute. I don't want to know that. Like because we are in a age where we have so much information and so much data. If my ROI is down or my conversion rates down or the return customers down, it actually puts me into a little bit of an emotional spin because what is it? Have I upset a returning customer? What's going on? And um, it's really nice to hear that story that you just said because it makes me alone. You're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> you're not alone. No, you're not alone. You need like a, a little club of all of you guys to just get together like a little support group and talk about all the things that you do that, you know, keep you up at night because you all have the same story. And I, I don't blame you. It's kind of like the curse of real time data now, right? The more analytics, the smarter we can get with how we run businesses and we target and, you know, we put our promotions out there. But at the same time, it can get a little obsessive, right? You can get a little bit obsessed with the numbers and it's that balance. Yeah, and I can control the reserve bank. Westpac asked me to come along to um, something they were doing with the treasurer to talk to the treasurer about how, you know, small businesses are affected by these rate changes and changes, the yeah. economy yeah. and how valuable it would be for them to hear from someone like me who is in e-commerce and how it affects people's online spending. I couldn't do it. I couldn't go. Because I said, it's just going to end up me being like, you know, when you see those people on a current affair yelling and carrying on and <laughs> sort of disappointment in the they need it. Been, they need someone like you. Like, so I just need to like try and cope. Yeah. Well, look, um, for the listeners listening, it's, been, it's an interesting segue, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, how you got started because your obsessiveness has come from a very long time. You founded numerous successful businesses, right? Um, one you exited um, and then another one we're going to talk about, Sandstrink as well. And so why don't we start off with a little bit about how you got started? Because I know you didn't start off as this kind of like serial entrepreneur, right? No, I come from a corporate background. You know, I worked in media since 1992. Not to go that far back, but I do. I worked um, with John Singleton as a big advertising guy back in the day. I remember like a town hall meeting in my agency where the managing director told everybody, we're getting this thing called email. <laughs> no more faxes. Actually, faxes still stuck around for quite a while, didn't they? People couldn't grasp not sending a fax. Yeah, yeah, no, they were still there from email. It, it developed into access to the internet. And again, I remember this email coming around saying it was company policy that we needed to go outside on our lunch break because everyone was so obsessed with this thing called the internet and they uh, leaving their desk anymore and they wanted to stay at, in their desk and Google things. I don't think it was Google then, it was Yahoo. Ask Jeeves. I think it might have been. <laughs> there was huge resistance actually in corporate to embrace the internet and to em embrace emails and those sorts of things. And then I ended up leaving an agency and working in-house at Universal Pictures, actually. And that's when um, I saw the introduction of Facebook and how we could use social media to talk about movies and film. Mm. And I saw the success of how that would work. And I also got to see the negativity of how that can work against brands as well. So for example, releasing a movie like Bridesmaids where you could tag, you know, who would be your bridesmaids and you could really mm. build great momentum around film by word of mouth. And that was super exciting. But then I, we also launched a movie called uh, The Borat Movie and that movie did very poorly because people came out saying that it was a crap movie and that again mm. went through on social media. I saw us come out of the John Singleton's age where we tell people this is the fridge to buy or this is the margarine to buy versus an era where brands are at the mercy of people's honest opinion of that product, mm. which will help people know what to buy. Marketing, I thought that was really interesting. And then I thought, I wonder how I can then use social media to create my own business that could be driven by people and I would no longer need a $20 million or a $10 million marketing budget to promote it because I could use the word of mouth and really talk about things that people connected with. And so Nourish Life, my first company was born out of, it was born out of a community of women who wanted better for them products without 
being loaded with parabens and toxins and all of those things that we've been told from reading Dolly Magazine and Cosmo and all of those things for all of those years that we need to put on our bodies. Nourish Life really took off because there was a realistic, honest, true analysis and recommendation on better for you products. And so that's how Nourish Life started threw myself into the world of social media and um, e-commerce. Delightful to be able to build a business while you still have a job and then see it so successful that you can actually leave. I'm curious the difference between then and now because you built Nourish Life off Facebook to begin with, right? And obviously your channels grew as, as Nourish Life grew. I was working for Unilever, so another CPG company, and we were doing some of the first campaigns on Facebook and MySpace at the time too. And it was so easy to cut through because there was your friends. And then when a brand came in and did something cool, you wanted to engage. It was kind of like the new thing. Now it's a little harder and it's harder to target too. So, you know, building a a sand drink now on Facebook versus Nourish Life then, what are you seeing in the differences? Oh, well, I mean, I don't even know where to start, (laughs) but I talk about this a lot. I went from a hundred dollars to $20 million just by using Facebook. I mean, I just, as soon as I realized that it was a a one to 15 conversion rate, Mm. just a license to print money. I talk about that a lot. Just put a couple thousand dollars on Facebook, post something that's amazing and telling people about it. And then it just converted. It was super easy to grow Nourish Life very easy and it was very affordable Mm. and very successful. So I started Sands Drinks in 2020 during the pandemic and the pandemic time of 2020 was social media heyday like it was when I started Nourish Life. People were at home on social media again and they were talking to family again because they couldn't see them in person. So I I also had the very same success rate when I launched Sands Drinks and I was able to run ads with my face to tell everyone I'd started a new business and target people who I knew would like natural products. So I was able to get Sands Drinks up and running very quickly with very little investment in the beginning because of that time. And also e-com was ha- really having such a great, <laughs> it was so good, the pandemic. The it lot- was good for so many brands. Yeah, it was really great for e-commerce. Yeah. Of it wasn't so good for the delivery because I don't think anyone ever got any of their deliveries. No. But it was certainly good for sales. Really what killed the ability to be able to use social media to grow a business was that everyone opted out of being followed. And I personally, I mean, I personally don't understand why so many people opted out because to be targeted by ads for things you care about, I can't think of a better way. Of, we, that's what we want, isn't it? To only see ads. Things that I, we're don't, I don't in. want products following me around the internet that I don't care about. I actually just want the products that, you know, I can discover that are completely targeted to me. So I completely agree with you. I do wonder sometimes why consumers don't understand the value of that. I know the perceived risk and the talk about, oh, they're following me around, but it's a very regulated system. It's not like, you know, they they know absolutely everything about you and, you know, they're following, you know, it's just, it, it, it's bizarre to me sometimes. I think there definitely needs to be a lot more education in that aspect so consumers feel more comfortable in turning cookies on. I completely agree. And so it's really that turning off of cookies that has stopped the ability for amazing small businesses to be able to reach people who really want those brands and there has been a huge swing now back to the original days where only the big brands with the really big budget are able to have enough reach now to yeah to create a business super disappointing because Mm. my sales stayed the same or or went up but the cost to acquire the customer right yeah yeah so I had to end up selling my properties and all of the money that I'd made from Nourish Lala um, in order to continue to drive the same amount of revenue through the business. So that's been incredibly challenging for me. And that's a real shame, actually. Anyway, everyone's moving to TikTok now (laughs) and there needs to be some opportunities there. TikTok success can be attributed to the fact that, again, it's based on interest targeting. Mm. So it, you know, knows that if I watch a video on kittens and to watch <laughs> one video on a beautiful cat giving birth to kittens and now everything on my feed is about cats and kitten things but yeah as opposed to Facebook which is really about connecting with other people 
and family. Mm. Anyway, so I think that's why TikTok's been really successful. And I've started to do more and more on that. How are you going with that? Because TikTok is a bit of a challenge. We had uh, on last uh, last year's season, the team at Mr. Consistent and Carissa came on and she was talking as well, you know, obviously a similar product. Hers is a cocktail mixer, but they also, you know, cater towards the non-drink or occasional drinker. She had a lot to say about, you know, the sometimes hard work it takes to cut through in TikTok. There's a lot of rules that brands have to follow. And if you break the rules, you're in trouble. So how are you going with that? In my personal opinion, TikTok is not a place for brands Mm. and it's not a place for celebrities. And I think that's where a lot of people are going wrong. And I think that Mr. Consistent is a really interesting example because it's a brand. See, for me, I started TikTok with Sans Drinks and I had very little interest and very little engagement. And then I recently moved and changed it to Irene Falcone, Mm. entrepreneur and founder of Sans Drinks. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. Going back to when we started, when Facebook launched, and it was all about people really wanting to engage with real people to understand about what brands they really like and not brands themselves. That's where TikTok's at. And so if you're a brand, I'm just going to put it out there. I don't think there's any place in let's Mm. a second ad for brands to be on TikTok. The founder of Mr. Consistent needs to be on TikTok. And the founder of Sans Drinks needs to be on TikTok, not Sans Drinks. When you're a a brand without a face, it's going to be incredibly more and more difficult. Anyway, I think they're banning TikTok anyway, aren't they? Let's see how that that paves out. Oh, goodness me. Um, Well, let's talk about that, actually. It's It's a really good segue into what is a key strategy for you around you as the face if you know anybody looks at any of your channels there's a lot of authenticity that comes through you are the face of sans drink you are the personality I love some of your content is just here I am in the store I've just come from a workout kind of thing like you don't you don't polish things you are what you are it's very real and I know it kind of stemmed back from your nourish life days right it is the easiest thing to do in the world being yourself It's so much easier. It's exactly the same advice I gave back in 2011. I'm going to attribute my success to the fact that I'm not the polished influencer or a model. I think that a lot of people like my businesses because people really resonate with that being myself. And people won't like me as well. Like there's people that like me and there's probably people that don't like me as well. I'm probably polarizing because I am myself. Okay. I'm just gonna interrupt here for one minute and give you some context. The night before this interview, I was scrolling Facebook and saw Irene post a question on whether she should change her business model. This was after struggling for months to keep up with retailers like Dan Murphy's and Woolworths, starting to stock the same non-alcoholic brands that she stocked. It was highly vulnerable, open and honest, and one of the most surprising posts I think I've ever seen from a founder. And I was waiting to bring it up when I'm changing Sands Drinks as of last night, I was really struggling with Sands Drinks because unlike Nourish Life, it took a really long time for all of the majors to copy my idea. But it took, mm. it, it, took it was really quickly. It was very fast on how quick the Dan's and the Woolworths and Coles jumped on the bandwagon of alcohol street drink. Yeah, much, much, much faster than Nourish Life. And I thought I'd have a few more years um, to establish myself and get some momentum. But that happened really quickly. And so I put in, I love social media so I'm so, so much. glad you're bringing this up because I really wanted to talk about this post. Did you see what I, It was brave. I saw night. it. I oh. saw. <laughs> yep. You posted and you said, guys, I want to change my entire direction I've been thinking about it was so honest you know I think I want to go down in the direction of premium what do you think how brave to just be so open on you know your social channels and say should I just change the entire direction of my business you tell me you were like at Nourish Life I do the same thing and I ask questions all the time and I I remember I made a mistake once and I, I actually stalked something that I shouldn't have by mistake and I put a thing out on Facebook and I said I've made a mistake like I effed up and I'm really sorry this product includes contains phenexiethanol that was a banned ingredient on my Mm. policy and I refunded everyone I said I was really sorry and I remember at the time thinking this is either going to make or break my business 
I got a reputation of trust. Mm. And then I, from there, I just will never, ever break that trust ever with a customer. And I was sort of thinking, I really need to get rid of all these supermarket brands. I was a superstar. I want to be the superstar. I want to be the booktopia of non out. And then I realized that the amount of money and the amount of properties and my car and everything that I have to sell to compete with the Dan's and the supermarkets on one person is going to, and we just talked earlier about how emotionally attached I am to my businesses and my customers and how much I care. I don't think I, I could have the mental stability to continually fight that. So like I have one store in one Westfield and that's also right. But mm. how do I then do 200 stores on my own one person, right? There's not one person called Dan Murphy's that is sitting at home, right? Signing leases at Westfield, right? There's, it's a huge company mm. and that I just use Dan's as one example, but you know, there's many chain stores out there. So I thought, well, I need to pivot. Like, what am I really good at? Like, what do my customers really love? And you know what I was scrolling through? This is why I wrote first. I was scrolling through social media and we've got like a private group as well, non out groups, like 2,000 people in it. And I was scrolling through that as well. And every freaking post on that was a product that I either created myself, one of my brands that I created, mm. or it was a brand that I have exclusively. So a brand like Next Destination Wines, where I work exclusively with these wineries to bring the cellar door experience to your home, an incredible quality that is unmatched by anything on the market, never mind anything that might be matched at a Dan's or worse, right? You'd never find a $20 bottle of a 2021 vintage Blanc de Blanc, right? Mm. This stuff is incredible. I thought that it was incredible, but to read through all of the people talking about how good these products were and made me realize very rarely have I, did I see any of the McGuigans and the Eden Vowels and stuff that I see at the supermarket have such a passionate re response on social by people. It takes a lot to take a photo and post it on your own back. Mm. I thought, I think I found my answer. Mm. Imagine if I don't want to be or I don't be the booktopia of non-elk, but I'd be the mecca of non-elk. When you go into Mecca, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, I know, but you can still go to Mecca and get something that's affordable. We can still get like, you know, more affordable masks and things. It's not about the, yeah. it's, it's about a curated yes. range of products that you can't just find in any supermarket or chemist warehouse. And they also have a really nice, beautiful selection of their own branded products as well that, that people know is a that are excellent. That I use use their oil cleanser. Of course, I have to. Same. I can't shop at Nourish Life. Same. It's my favorite. The Mecca oil cleanser is insanely good. I'm going to make one of those if I ever get Nourish Life back. But yes. Um. So that made me think. I think that's what I need to do. Then fear kicked in. I was like, I'm going to lose forty percent of my revenue if I do this because I do still sell a lot of the supermarket brands and they do sell. And I started getting into a panic. And I posted that question last. I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And who do I ask? I called up Tony Nash, the founder of Booktopia. I asked him, I asked Errol, all these people, and I didn't really get the exact answer I needed. I realized, I think I just need to, oh my God. Yes, you need to ask your customers. So I asked and, oh my goodness, right? Did you see the responses? Oh my goodness. I did. Everyone was extremely positive. They're going to stick with you if you pick premium. Amazing products you can't get anywhere else. You don't care paying premium because you know it's quality. I trust what's in Mecca. Your customers said they're all cult products. So what are you going to do? I, I love what you just said because I love that word cult. I have taken all of the feedback from all of my customers and I first thing I'm going to do today because I do this recording this morning and um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change. Interestingly, I already rebranded the website and it's much classier now. It's, it's definitely more premium feel. And I think what I'm going to do is put on clearance all the brands I'm going to discontinue. I'm going to really pair back, focus on the cult products. And if they're not a cult product, I'm going to make them a cult product now. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is find six to 10 everyday experts. I'm going to have a panel of these people and it's going to be like the Karen with 
four kids who lives on the northern beaches, who loves drinking wine during the week and during the weekend, but wants non out during the week. I'm going to have a soccer dad expert who drinks beer, but also likes non out beer. And I'm going to put together a matrix system on what criteria you need to pass to be stocked on sans drinks. And as part of that, you need to have the taste test ticked by the group of everyday experts. Oh my God, I love this. Well, yeah, I love I, it. I'm going to remove er- everything off my website that has artificial sweetener in it, like aspartame. I'm so sorry, mm. Ons, but you're going to go. You're gone. Off Gordon's gin, gone. And I'm going to also remove everything that has more than five grams of sugar per hundred. Oh, please do. And it's my bugbear about non-alcoholic wine. It tastes right, like grape juice. Alcohol. And I'm also going to colour everything with artificial colours. In it. There's nothing against these brands, but I'm going to make my own ingredients policy and tasting policy with a team of everyday, just everyday people um, that represent the community. And I'm going to make Sands drinks, um, yeah, like the non-alcoholic mecca, right? That's the only way I can describe it. Amazing. I couldn't sleep after reading all those comments. You've just given everybody listening kind of an eye in, or an ear, I should say, into the brain of such an exceptional founder that is obsessive about the customer. And you've just like, I can see it. I can hear the excitement all off the back of your customer. Your customer said what they wanted. You thought about it. You were like, I'm going to ask them. And they said yes. And you've just, you're going with it. No, there's no fear or trepidation. You're just going for 40% it. Forty percent of my sales are going to go overnight, and my other feedback was around delivery times as well and postage times. You know, it's really hard. I use Australia Post, and I love Australia Post as well. But to goodness me, do they love to smash a bottle? Yes. So I'm actually testing a new delivery partner today. I'm hoping to solve that problem as well. So mm. we need to be able to be nimble enough to pivot on a dime when our customers give us feedback, particularly when it's so overwhelming. Huge lesson. I think a huge lesson for founders. I mean, it's, you know, it's so easy when you get to your level of success to slow down a little bit on the decision making and it becomes a bit of a political conversation. Whereas I just love your gusto. You just like, no, we're just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. I already know what I'm going to do. I know what I have to do. How do you find that confidence in you? Because it's a confidence thing, right? you got to trust your gut. To be fair, it came out of desperation of the fact that if I continue to go on this journey of trying to compete with a supermarket, that I'm going to lose. I'm not going to have any mm. things to sell and I'm going to run out of money and then I'm going to be forced to have to take on investors. And I don't really want to do that. I really have always done this on my own the Irene way. I'm more confident to make decisions when I am only answerable to myself. It was really hard to make a decision on anything when I had sold my company Mm. to BWX because Nourish Light was famous for not stocking Sukin because Sukin was known as a really natural brand and it was such a great stepping stone into the world of natural. But I never stocked it because it included phenexiethanol which is an ingredient that's banned by the certification board. It's a preservative and it was just part of my ingredients policy that I don't stock anything with phenexiethanol. And for me, it was a way to differentiate between natural and fake natural mm. at the time, because at the time, the supermarkets were all stocking the same as they are with the non-alcoholic drinks. So the supermarkets are stocking non-alcoholic drinks that are full of sugar. It's not just me that's saying this. Read the comments. They're crap, right? Mm. And like, the same with what was happening with Nourish Life is the supermarkets of the chemist warehouse were selling all these natural products called natural, but they weren't really natural. And And it was really hard for people to understand the difference. So I thought, I'm going to draw a line in the sand to this is going to be my ingredients matrix and this is what I'll accept and what I won't accept. And people know. Anyway, then I got bought out by Sukin because BWX (laughs) is the manufacturer of Sukin, right? And I remember in the meetings when they were acquiring me, but I don't understand. I don't stock Sukin. Yeah, what what are you doing? (laughs) I don't think you should buy me. This isn't going to work. This is the wrong fit. And they said, we don't care, don't stock it then, we don't stock it. So I had it written in my contract that I get to decide what I sell and what I don't sell. We were, we were coming into the pandemic. Hand wash was really hard to get. Mm. And they said, in a stock suit and on Nourish Life. Mm. And I said, you can't. I remember exactly where I was when, when that conversation happened. And I said, well, you can't. It's against the ingredients policy and it's against my contract and everything. And they said, well, it's up to you. Irene, it's up to you. But people need hand wash and we're in a pandemic. So I put an, a thing on Facebook, said, guys, I would not normally do this, but 
It's very hard to get hand wash now. You couldn't get hand wash at the supermarket this time. I'm going to stock Souk and hand wash on my site, but I'm going to call it out really clearly that it's got the next ethanol in it. This is not normally part of my ingredients policy, but we're in a pandemic and I'm going to let you choose. And people were like, really grateful. Thank you so much. No, we understand. And anyway, and I, we sold a lot of hand wash and that was all great. But unfortunately for me, it was a stepping stone. And I think as soon as I left, I think you'll find that a lot of Sukans on there now. I haven't checked lately. That was certainly a stepping stone to when the pandemic was over. Did they then remove it? Is it still on there? Mm. And there's a lot to be said about integrity. If you're going to make a decision and you're going to listen to your customers, you need to stay true to it and you cannot be swayed by money. You have to think long term as well as short term and not just the sales that you're driving today, but you know, how are you building that customer base for tomorrow? I am curious because you focus so much on the consumer making decisions around them or what do they want and what do they care about, which is like such a refreshing way to look at your business, not just, you know, at bottom line and what's going to sell more product and how do I get as much product out there as possible. How much of your customer base are repeat customers and how do you continue to drive that loyalty? It's 50-50 every day being self-funded. I have the, the challenges of cash flow, but I also have the, the ability to have a business that is 100% consumer focused and I am genuinely live and breathe it rather than just put it on a PowerPoint presentation when it's a load of crap. How is that playing out as, as a strategy for repeat customers, for lifetime value? You've built two very successful, you know, retail brands off the back of just listening to the customer and being your true and authentic self. Yeah, I think that the customers that, that weren't meant to be will, 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 I think Woolworths and Dan's will pick up some of my customers and I think that I will gain more customers as more and more people know that I exist and how, what a great job I do on drinking non-alcoholic drinks that taste fantastic and um, are better for you. So let's talk a little bit about marketing and you've, again, you've been yeah, founder for quite a while, exited one business, launched another one. I mean, let's not ignore the fact that, you know, you stepped into a category non-alcoholic drinks that is really only just growing in groundswell. It's getting a little trendier now, <laughs> starting to see some bars and stuff selling some non-alcoholic wines and stuff, which is quite nice because um, not everybody wants to drink. If, even if you're not a complete, like, I don't drink at all, like there's a lot of people who just don't like to drink very oh, often. Yeah, 80% of my customers drink alcohol still. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Which is why it's so important to get the good tasty alternatives for them. I think people that just, yeah, pre people that just don't drink at all Either don't like the taste of wines, so they don't drink it, or they're pretty okay with it tasting like grape juice, and that's fine. And they can chop it, Woolies, and they can chop it, Dan. Yeah, but you're welcome to it. <laughs> it does, unfortunately. Yeah, the ones that I've tasted mostly have tasted like uh, grape juice, yeah. but I've had quite a few good little spritzes. I have to say, they do a good job of making a a non-alcoholic spritz tastes like the real deal, like I'm sitting in Italy on a beach. Oh, like an Aperol spritz yes. alternative. Yes. I know. Um, I would say that other than gin and tonic, the spritz alternative, yeah, they are my second biggest category other than wines. So let's talk about like marketing and what are the things you've learned over the years? You know, obviously social has been a big channel for you, but what else um, has been working for you in terms of sort of driving new customers and driving awareness? Because both businesses, have, you've been at the forefront of, I guess, the category and moving the category forward. So what have been some of the tactics that you've done? You know what? I don't have any tactics. I actually don't. I just say what I feel and do what I think mm. and let the customers know what I found. That is your tactic. I put a photo up on social media of me in my workout gear and I'm by the way very flattered that you thought I'd come back from a workout post that photo and talk about something that's amazing that I've discovered and or review something and that will convert to a lot of sales I know with the Barossa Valley Shiraz that I stock I said that I thought it was a really good alternative to a Penfold bin 389 I'm a huge wine collector and I had a full wine cellar full of Penfolds and Body and Soul picked up on that and then they did their own review on it and they said this is the wine and the non-alcoholic Barossa Valley Shiraz that you can use that, that's similar. That, I can't say that tastes like a Penfold's been 389 but it's as close as you're going to get. Well, I sold 22 pallets wow. of that wine in one month. 
the winery ran out of this product. That's like 13,000 bottles of one wine in a month. And that was because of that body and soul article. But I didn't really go out like it wasn't really, it was just me being honest. And it got, luckily I got picked up by mainstream media, which is amazing. But the photo of me talking about it in my exercise gear resulted in that sale. Now on the flip side, I recently spent money I didn't have doing a very glossy photo shoot for me and my products. Mm. And I put the very expensive photo airbrushed. It's very expensive to airbrush me. I kept saying there's wrinkles, there's this and that. But anyway, I put that on there and I literally got two likes. Yeah. Two really likes. telling. I hid the photos and with no sales. So I think that it's so much cheaper to tell you as well. I have an anti-influencer policy. I was just going to ask that. Yeah. Do you use influence what? since you are no. essentially the influencer for the brand? Yeah, that's a really important point I want to raise for any entrepreneurs out there that think that they need to hire influencers. You are the influencer as the business mm. owner. You're the influencer. And there's one really great thing about being a business owner versus using an influencer, there's two really great things. Firstly, influencers are bloody expensive and, and it's a one shot for a one-off thing or whatever as an influencer. And secondly, they need to disclose that it was paid, right? Yeah. I don't know about you. When I see that someone has been paid to promote a product, I scroll straight past it. And I think it has zero credibility. If anything, I think it goes against the brand because you had to pay someone to say they liked it, right? Mm. If you find anyone that likes your product, you got to pay someone to like it. Business owners need to just be the authentic selves and save all that influencer money and put that into something else, maybe paid ads to promote themselves, promoting the product. As I have in the past used influencers. I have tested it in very early days, early on, but I realized I didn't drive anywhere near the sales I drove myself. Just by being yourself. I guess it's a really good lesson for people listening and you as the founder being the face because there's certainly a lot of cases where a brand has been very successful without having a founder as a face. But I think it's that testament to finding what your authentic voice is and what is going to resonate. And, you know, I think you've really found that. What is a great example that I don't think the founder's really on that rank body pay. Yes. It's amazing, by the way. It's friggin' awesome. But again, they didn't really use paid influencers to build free or mm. they just use real people using the product. Yeah. And I think that's a great strategy too. I mean, that should be part of everybody's strategy. You know, how do we actually use our customers to be our number one marketing channel? Your customer is your number one marketing channel. If you look at, you know, the most effective channels for consideration, number one is referrals from friends and family that I trust. And so... You know, how do you find a way to just build a product? To your point, you've built a product that people love and they feel a part of, they feel invested in because they're actually helping you make decisions for that business, which is such a beautiful way to build that loyalty. And then they're telling their friends and family about it and they're getting amazing products as well, like the best in the market. So that is honestly the best way. And, and you know, kudos to you for just like going with your gut and your true self Thank and just you. like keeping it real and, you know, look at the success that you've seen so far. So I'm really excited to see what this pivot, you know, looks like as well. I think I'm going to have to get on more, maybe, you know, get some boxes and do some trying of some of these better wines because I've only ever tried the cheaper ones. And I've always been like, is this the quality? Because I don't really, I'd rather get the little cans of like, cocktails and bits and pieces than, you know, the wine. So I, you've mentioned a few. I think we're going to have to put some in the show notes and people are going to have to go and give it a go. There's some really great ones and the reviews are on there. You can see which ones are getting the five stars and which ones aren't. So, yeah. So I want to ask a question just on um, some of your performance marketing and, and affiliate marketing specifically, because I know you guys are, are pretty big players in that space. And so I think for people listening, they might be a little confused because affiliate marketing often gets bundled in with influencer marketing. So I'd love to hear what you guys are doing in the space and how that's sort of helping you drive business. Um, affiliate marketing has been the second biggest driver to my businesses. At Nourish Life, I used Commissions Factory and it was the best thing I ever did. Mm. It was huge because there was a lot of beauty writers, a lot of beauty influencers. That was really great for my business. When I moved to Sands Drinks, it was really hard to get back to the Commissions Factory because I was starting from scratch. So I went with another affiliates company, another one, and 
I was actually like really disappointed <laughs> with that because I was expecting it to be like blow up, like Nourish Life blew up and it didn't, wasn't mm. the same. Didn't get the same level of service. I didn't get the same level of service, but more importantly, it actually sunk me financially. It was so expensive that I decided I wasn't going to do affiliate marketing anymore. Problematic for me, actually. So I decided not to do any at all. And then I saw a decrease in sales and I thought this, this needs to be a better way. So then I asked the agency if they could please try and get me back onto the commissions factory again, because it's been a couple of years now and maybe they'll take me. Um, yeah, anyway, so I got back on there and now I'm rebuilding my affiliate marketing and I'm doing a nice trajectory like when I started Nourish Life. So I'm really happy and I'm never looking back again. Yeah. I've got a little bit of work to do now because I need to build more affiliates. So it's been a bit of a journey, but I'm so happy that I'm doing it. I think affiliate marketing is the last influencer marketing you're allowed to do without saying that it's a pain. <laughs> it's a pain. <laughs> no. um, which is great. There's like a big button that pops up to say that. I mean, it obviously the, many people disclose it on their website. Yeah. But even when you read the disclosures, they're really well done. Like think like Mamma Mia, for example, would be an affiliate of mine. But they'll say, you know, some of these links, we make a small amount of commission on it. Yes. But they're only the links based on products we would have added to the article anyway, that we would have promoted anyway. They just happen to have an affiliate link as part of the link to their site. And so it's a very genuine still and honest. It's not like they're getting paid by one person to promote their product. They could just get the same amount of commission no matter who they promoted. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at with affiliates. Let me know and be an affiliate and be a taste tester. That'd be great. <laughs> I'm sure most publishers would be willing or writers or editors out there would be willing to have a taste. Is there anything in particular, you know, publisher or two that just like kills it for you oh, in terms of sales? Yeah, no, the top affiliates for me are not media. They're actually experts in the non-alcoholic drinking space. Excellent. Yeah, or I've always found that bloggers with their own community of followers, mm. particularly those that have beautiful communities that actually want to support the affiliate. So for example, I've got a lovely, a beautiful affiliate in WA and she's a coach for grey area drinking. Her followers know they don't need to click on her website to buy from me. They can just buy from me, but they are so supportive of her. They always make a special effort to make sure that they click on their affiliate link and mm. then buy from me. So that way that content creator and coach that makes a living on what she does gets paid for the free content that she puts out. And I think that's probably one of the most beautiful things about the community support, knowing that they've just been able to help fund a content creator, make more free content purely by clicking on an affiliate link before they buy makes absolutely no difference to the consumer at all. They get the same amount of money. In fact, in many cases, they get a little bit of an extra discount mm. through that person. So I think that's probably where knowing my personality now after talking to me, you can see why that would be more special. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I mean, you're, you're so focused on people and community and listening to the people. And, and it's nice that, you know, through such a big company like Commission Factory, you can find some of these more niche bloggers as well. And how are you sort of built, c continuing that relationship over time? Because there is that ability to sort of grow that relationship you know, through Commission Factory, right? Yeah, and how to grow the relationship through the same bloggers or more bloggers. Yeah, more bloggers building more and sort of, I, I guess it's kind of like going back to the point that you made before that you're back on the platform, but it's going to take some time because it does take time. I think people kind of assume you go in and it's just like a buy and, you know, you buy a few bloggers. And oh, you've got to work on it. Like at Nourish Life, I had a full-time in-house person that did nothing but work on the commissions factory for me. I can't remember exactly, but at least I'm going to say 15 or 20% of my revenue came from affiliates and that took like 10 years to grow with Commissions Factory and it was amazing. And I'm so happy to be back there. <laughs> I actually have uh, Emily sitting in the, do in, in the next room next to me. So she's probably sitting there going, thank you. <laughs> I've used the two top affiliate companies and I'm back with Commissions Factory because part it is really cost effective as well. Like it's Mm. Well, and I'm very conscious of finance, cash flow, but it's more community based and more user friendly and more of the bloggers as opposed to just the, the cash rewards. Mm. It feels less corporate and less performancey. Yeah. I think there's something about Commission Factory 
that I feel like they have a lot of the same values as you. It's about creators as well and authenticity. And it's not just about clipping a ticket on a sale and driving as much sales as possible. It's also, you know, understanding how those affiliate relationships and everybody who can be added to the mix can also help brand as well as drive sales. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't want it to be a commercial. Yeah, I mean, but like in my hands down genuineness of everything, I will never leave the commissions factory again and I will never run the risk of not having it on board. I can see my affiliate partners making some days a lot more money than I do. Let's just put this, break this down into a business sense for a second. Let us say with the average affiliate, affiliate commission percentage across the board to retail, just use an average example and let's just pick a number. Let's just say 8% commission, right? If we Great. just yeah. as an example. Now, if we think about a business, a retail business that is like an online store that sells products at just say a GP of about 50%, 40 to 50% GP, it's not uncommon for a retail business to maybe have an EBITDA of 5 to 10% profit, just say 8% profit, for example. So if you... Think about the amount of work and cash outlay, literally again, I sold my car and my house to fund a couple of months worth of stock. If you think about the amount of money it takes to build a business, warehousing and storage and wages, payroll tax, marketing, think about all that. Let's think about all the overheads. If you can make even 5% commission, mm. not having to buy stock, not having to house it. All you need to do is market it and talk about the product. I'm telling you now, I would way, way prefer to be on the affiliate side <laughs> of the fence than on the store founder side of the fence. Mm. And so if anyone is thinking about be getting into affiliate marketing, I mean, not this Amazon affiliate marketing crap you see on TikTok, but seriously, find a store or a brand you love, then you can run your own business as basically being a franchise almost, yeah. right, of your brand with any of the overheads at all and still make the same amount of net profit <laughs> as the retailer Is this has. the next business for you, Irene? No, 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 it's not because I can't promote other people's products. So I wouldn't you don't feel the me. love of it. Yeah. No, I'm going to be the bootstrap founder than be the rich affiliate. But in general... That, that is what I think is super exciting because, again, I'm customer-centric and I'm centric around people that, like mums at homes and stuff, I want them to be able to make income mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So yep. for, I think that for me, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. So it's a pretty cool thing. And in return, the retailer gets someone talking about their product to a community and doing some of the marketing for them, which is great. Yeah, it is. It's really good. We had... um. We had Jodie Allen on here. She was our very, very, very first guest on our first season at Stay at Home Mum. And she started her business after being let go, eight months pregnant, no job in sight and no idea what to do. And she built a Facebook community and asked people on Facebook, what do I do? Because I've just lost my job and I'm about to have a child and we're building a house and we've got really bad clash fellow. And she had 50,000 mums join her community in the space of two days and give her a ton of advice. And that's how she built Stay at Home Mum. And majority of her money that comes in is through affiliates. Isn't that amazing? Um, it's amazing. <laughs> She's literally built this business off recommending products and tips and tricks and all sorts of other things, recipes and whatever, to groups of mum who just want real advice. There's an audience out there, there's people listening and there's money to be made and it works. You do need to find the right affiliate platform though I will say that genuinely yeah it can make, make you as well it's not the easiest thing to navigate as well and it takes time it's not just like something that you can do or buy and then does it work or it doesn't like you have to really you really got to test and learn and, and understand that it's going to take a while before you start to like really see that traction that you know really starts to move the needle and you can grow from there so you kind of need a good partner don't you that's going to take you on that journey and has the right experience and it's just going to help you through those first few months as well. See, it actually is tricky. The, like the setup and stuff 
from the, not from mm. a retailer perspective, but from an affiliate. I remember it being a bit fiddly. So once you get set up, it's worth it. We just need more experts in the field too. That's one of the challenges. Not enough experts who run, you know, can sit in the brand side of things as well. So lucky you've been able to find people on your team that you can sort of put in that position and just go run with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Irene, I um, I want to thank you today. We went way over. This has been such an incredible conversation. I wasn't expecting, I, you know, I knew, I knew your reputation as sharing a lot about yourself and the business and putting yourself out there. But I actually want to thank you for your vulnerability because you were very vulnerable in some moments here. And I think it's really nice to hear a founder sort of not just talk about the success, but also the things that keep you up at night and the things you continue to work on. Good luck with the pivot. I'm going to let you go now so you can just start to completely change the direction of your company. Exactly. We'll leave some uh, information in the show notes for anyone who is listening to, to some of those bottles and names that you dropped if they want to try a drop or two. And I want to ask if we can have you back on the show to hear how things are going. I think I'd love, we'd love to do a follow-up. Absolutely, I would love that. Yes, let's do a follow-up and I'll let you know if that would went. Excellent. I know we're going to get the honest truth, so <laughs> we'll be curious to hear how it goes. Thank you. Thank you. We have another exciting episode coming up. Here's a sneak peek. One thing we like to say is that if no one else in this world has ever done this idea before, there are two possibilities for that. One, you are the genius. Out of billions of people, you are the first person, you know, 100 years. To well done to you. Yeah. <laughs> the other one is that, you know, the other, the idea might not. Uh, be a viable one and that's why people have tried they've failed and, yeah. and, and they've not succeeded if you aren't already don't forget to follow so you don't miss an app and while you're there why not drop us a rating and review we'd love to hear what you think flex your hustle is made possible by the great team at commission factory and produced by ample i'm michelle lomas keep hustling and bye for now Commission Factory.